right, it's 10 o'clock. Um, I see a few people have joined us, so we'll probably go ahead and get started. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Erin Schneider. I work at City Match. Uh, you might remember me from the webinar last week um, with Andy Wessel from the Douglas County Health Department. Uh, so today we're doing a follow-up webinar with Dr. Jean Marie Place. Um, she's going to be speaking to us about some of the work that they've been doing in Indiana with uh, Hispanic and Latino folks and infant mortality. Um, <clears throat> just a couple housekeeping things before we get started. Uh, it sounds like um, the line's pretty quiet, so I'm not going to mute the lines. Um, if you if you need to mute, you can press star six, and to unmute is star seven. Um, and I think um, Dr. Place said she's um, open to folks you know, asking questions and having discussion. You're free to, to chime in on the phone line, or you can also write things into the chat box. Um, she also has a, a video at, towards the end of the presentation. I'm going to try to get that to work. Um, I'm just going to let you know it might not work. So <laughs> we're going to be sending a, a follow-up email with links to videos and, and things. So um, you'll be getting all the information that we're presenting today after, after the webinar. So, so I'll, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. So um, it's a pleasure to be here. I was so tickled that people were interested in, in our um, project here. So I'll just go ahead and get started on the next slide. So um, we received funding from the Indiana Minority Health Coalition um, to do a community academic partnership. I was really thrilled with this opportunity because um, I lived and worked in Mexico at the National Institutes of Public Health, and they are the ones that introduced me to the frameworks methodology. And we worked on a project in Mexico about reframing adolescent pregnancy to garner the attention of policymakers and um, try to align public opinion with the, the solutions that are most productive as the objective of frameworks. That, that's what it's all about. So um, you can turn to the next slide. So I wanted to apply frameworks to um, the population in Indiana. And then the next slide, um, particularly as it relates to infant mortality. So you can see in the dark blue state, uh, the dark blue counties, that's where our Hispanic Latino population is um, at the highest. I'm down in Delaware County, east central Indiana, but we worked on a project up in the northwest. You can go to the next slide. And one more. So as you know, um, infant mortality is a significant problem in the United States. And I think uh, many of you are working on these issues in your own state. What really struck me um, about my state here in Indiana is that if we were to rank all of the states um, that at least reported data, and in this case it's 33 states, um, data about infant mortality, Indiana would rank dead last, meaning we have the very worst rates for infant mortality among those who are the states that are reporting infant mortality rates for the Hispanic Latino population. And then the next slide. But what is hopeful about this situation is that we can identify um, the main contributors to infant mortality among this population. So we know what causes it in a lot of ways. We know that um, if we were to reduce birth, low birth weight, if we were to try to prevent preterm births, and if we could um, help um, the Hispanic Latino population to better plan pregnancies and to avoid teenage pregnancy, um, we would have a better chance at reducing the infant mortality rate among this population. So the next slide. And so one more slide. So I'll tell you, um, when I heard about frameworks, I thought, oh, I really want to apply it to this problem in Indiana. Um, if you turn to the next slide. And we learned about this last week, but the whole idea behind frameworks is that we try to focus on the way the public is currently perceiving a problem. And what really struck me is that you don't focus on the intent of our message, but you focus on how it's received by the public. Um, a little anecdote that I really remembered as I studied with Frameworks and did several of their trainings is that nonprofits historically have put out a great deal of, of quantitative information. We love to disseminate facts and figures and, and, and really talk about the crisis or the epidemic, and, and then we have the, this data to back up our claims. 
Um, but the frameworks have done research saying that that's not a best practice. That's not um, a productive way to get people's attention or to move issues up the agenda. Um, it might be because, as they mentioned, there are different ways that people can understand an issue, and they sort of default to the easiest way to understand an e issue. But Frameworks is all about um, providing a metaphor to people that can help us help guide the public to the most appropriate way to think about a problem. Um, and so metaphors help us to reframe issues, to, to improve public understanding, and align the public's understanding with what the research says about it without necessarily using um, the quantitative data that backs up the research. So again, this it really appealed to me when I learned about this, as it sounds like it's appealed to a lot of you. So I'll show you what we did with this in terms of um, the problem we were facing with infant mortality in our state. So go ahead and switch to the next slide. I, I know that you all have listened to the webinar, but I'll just briefly um, give you an example of, of why I thought Frameworks is an exciting model. It's because in the early 1990s, we were talking about child development, so I'll use this particular example because I think it's really fruitful to describe the power of the frameworks methodology. Um, in the early 1990s, we were talking about child development uh, uh, using the terms like we've got to get kids kindergarten ready. And we would use phrases and words like we just need to teach them the alphabet or help kind of put in the number system and put in the alphabet and put in some books and put in some love and they're going to be, quote, kindergarten ready. Using those words and fra that frame was a lot like seeing kids' brains as a container, something that you just needed to put some good stuff inside and they would be, you could close the door and they would be ready to be shipped off to kindergarten. Um, but when frameworks came in and did some of their studies, they really realized that a more productive model for talking about child development was using the words brain architecture. Because when we talk about brain architecture, it changes the way we think about child development. And we're all of a sudden starting to think about child development and the brain as something we have to construct and something that we have to build and that we have to strategically design. And, and it requires active rather than sort of a pa passive participation from the community and, and from those that surround children. And I really loved how this new way of looking at it, a new metaphor, could literally change the way that we um, design policies about child development. So we can go ahead and um, switch to the next slide. So this was a model that I designed myself. I made this graphic, but it uses principles of frameworks. And I used this graphic to describe the actual steps that we went through and that Frameworks recommends for, first of all, understanding current frames that the public is using about a particular problem, and then how to reframe that issue. The first thing that they say that you can, need to do is you need to first learn how that population is currently thinking about the issue. In order to do this, they recommend doing in-depth interviews with a sample of the population you're interested in. They kind of talk about using an ice cream scoop to just scoop up as much as you can about public perception of a particular issue. Then once you've done that, you analyze that qualitative data and you kind of um, boil it down to the major ways that they're thinking about an issue and you map the gaps. Or in other words, you compare the public understanding with what um, research talks about or what the experts say or what the data backs up, the part, in what ways the data backs up the understanding of the particular problem. So there's probably going to be a gap between how the public sees it and how, quote unquote, researchers or experts see that problem. After you map the gaps and you understand what are the roadblocks or cognitive holes in understanding, we aim to create a metaphor or create the, a, a new message that might bridge that gap. They use metaphors because they, are, they can be very meaningful, um, they're quick and easy, they kind of open the door in a very easy way to a quick understanding of an issue because metaphors are generally already familiar to us. So um, if you switch to the next phase, 
Um, after you've created maybe a set of three different metaphors, then you need to go and test those metaphors with the original population in order to figure out which metaphor um, aligns best with, with the researcher's understanding of the particular issue. So you test those candidate messages. Um, you can test them through essentially focus groups. Frameworks calls them peer discourse sessions. But they, we did, um, and I'll, I can explain this more, but we did two main focus groups where we pulled together about 30 different people and we introduced the metaphors and then listened to how, as they found symbolism in the metaphor, what kind of symbolism they found and if it correctly aligned with the symbolism we wanted them to find. Um, and then the, one of the last steps is a persistence trial. Oh. So that's choosing the particular metaphor that best aligns with the researcher understanding. And then it's a little bit like playing the telephone game. You send the metaphor, give it out to one or two people, and then teach those people that they need to explain the metaphor to another set of people. So then they explain it to another set of people. They tell that set of people they need to explain it to an additional set of people. And thus it goes to see if the metaphor sticks to see if the metaphor, um, the important components of the metaphor can safely travel through a population without getting distorted or without um, losing its meaning. And those are called persistence trials. And then the last, um, uh, hopefully you've reached the point where you're able to provide recommendation to stakeholders about what metaphor should be more widely disseminated in the community to help um, enhance a public understanding of this particular problem. So you've reached the point of evidence-based communication recommendations. And you can go ahead and switch it to the next slide. Um, I'm just going to bring up my particular research aims as I led this project, but then I would love to open it up to um, those who are listening to ask if they have any questions at this point about sort of the nuts and bolts of implementing this process. So just quickly, what, again, the first thing that we needed to do was understand how the public understood infant mortality. So we did um, some in-depth interviews. We collected this qualitative data to learn how they perceive the causes of infant mortality. Our second objective was to then map the gaps. We compared it with what the researchers know and then we tried to create these three different metaphors that might enhance public understanding. And then our third aim was to test those metaphors. We identified one metaphor that was really salient and that really rose to the top and helped to help the understanding. Um, and it was a correct understanding and it traveled very well through the population. We then created a video to illustrate this metaphor and we worked and are working to disseminate it among healthcare providers and also the public at large. So are there any questions at this point about sort of the different steps of the process? I'll spend the rest of the time talking about um, the results that we found and the process we went through as it relates to infant mortality. You can press start to unmute your line. Okay, maybe I'll just keep going. Go ahead and switch to the next slide, but don't hesitate to jump in if you have any questions. So as we wanted to understand the public understanding of the problem, we did these 10 qualitative interviews. I wish we could have done more. Had I had a larger grant and more time, it would have been more appropriate to do between 25 and 35 interviews. Um, that's what Frameworks recommends. But nevertheless, um, we met with individuals and the Northern Indiana Hispanic Health Coalition helped us to recruit participants for these interviews. We provided incentives. We spoke with them in both Spanish and English depending on their comfort level. We had IRB approval so that we could record the interviews and then, of course, analyze the data. Um, and something important that I want to mention, if you sw switch to the next slide, is that we did not only interview moms and dads. We interviewed the whole, um, as many as we could from the broad range of people in the Hispanic Latino community. In other words, we interviewed grandmothers and grandfathers, moms and dads, um, young people without kids, teenagers, 
um, both immigrants, um, those who had been raised in the United States, because again, if you imagine an ice cream scoop, we just wanted to understand the basic cultural model people thought about when we said the words infant mortality. And in order to get that broad scoop of understanding, we needed to interview a broad range of people. So you can see the ages and um, men and women and different people in this population so we could understand the broadest possible model for their understanding of infant mortality. And then go ahead and switch to the next slide. So the art interview guide, I'm happy to send it out to anyone who may be interested in adapting it for their own population. Um, but in, in essence, we ask them, what do you think a healthy pregnancy consists of? What do you think constitutes a healthy infancy? Um, a question that really generated a lot of rich data was simply to ask, what do you think causes infant mortality? Can it be prevented and by whom? That generated a lot of fascinating data. The questions were open-ended in order to get them to describe, again, their default understanding, what came to their mind. And then switch the slide, please. So we use grounded theory. If you're not necessarily an expert in a qualitative data analysis, um, you're essentially looking for themes. So based on each question that you pose to the participant, what, uh, what is the answer that m most rises to the top, that people say most often, and you're try to, trying to capture major themes? Grounded theory is a way to do that. Um, that's what we used. We had three different people code the data so we could be assured that the conclusion that one coder was coming to was a conclusion that other coders or other researchers also agreed with. Um, after we analyzed this data, we, did, we moved to the next step of the process, with, which was mapping the gaps. Or in other words, how does the public understanding differ from an expert understanding of what causes infant mortality or how a healthy pregnancy and a healthy infancy is produced? And of course, does it differ? Perhaps it, um, it wouldn't have differed. In our case, it did, and I'll tell you the results that we found, but um, it of course doesn't necessarily always have to differ. The public understanding may be um, aligned with what the research says. So then go ahead and switch to the next slide. This is what we learned, that when we said the words infant mortality, um, they thought the, of the words child abuse. In fact, they really aligned the two concepts almost exactly the same. They thought infant mortality was child abuse, and they thought that an infant who died um, was, was, pro it was most likely due to abuse or neglect. This was a huge revelation for us. We have been using the word infant mortality um, without defining it, which caused confusion and led perhaps to people thinking that it, infant mortality was the cause of child abuse. They also mentioned that they felt like infant mortality had a lot to do with um, just lack of parental responsibility or parental neglect. And they also talked about it being um, the cause of children falling downstairs or being dropped or falling off of couches or getting into the medicine cabinet, things like that. Um, they attributed infant mortality, again, with external threats. So if you switch it to the next slide and we map the gaps, you can see that this is um, based on um, state data of what's causing um, deaths in the neonatal period. So if you look at the northern region, which is on the right-hand side, you can see that the green portion is the largest percentage. That means that those deaths are attributed to things that are happening in the prenatal period, and that um, on the right-hand side, the black part of that bar graph is saying that is the percentage that's attributable to things that are happen happening in the postnatal period, which is really significant because if you switch it to the next slide, you can see that, again, in the northern region, which is where we're working, the greatest causes of infant mortality are in that 53.3%, that green portion of the pie chart. Um, those are things like the perinatal risks, things like low birth weight, um, things like preterm birth, and um, teen pregnancy, so perhaps not getting adequate prenatal care. Um, 
that differs in large degree from what the public thought were the causes of infant mortality. They thought the largest causes were assaults and accidents, which in reality only comprise just under 7%. So I'll go ahead and switch, switch the slide, please. So then it, we reached the point where we needed to identify some different candidate metaphors. What could better enhance the public understanding of what truly causes infant mortality, which again, were things like prenatal, uh, perhaps lack of prenatal care or preventing teen pregnancies, um, getting them adequate prenatal care so we could reduce preterm birth and low birth weight. So we thought about maybe if we talk about these issues in terms of building a house. Maybe if we talk about them in terms of planting a seed and sort of an innovative idea, we thought, what about like playing a balloon game? Because we thought, you know, if you remember playing this as a kid, every child has a piece of the balloon, kind of like every piece of the community sector has a responsibility for keeping that ball on top of the balloon and not falling outside of the region of the balloon. So that's the idea that we had with this balloon game metaphor. The seed metaphor, we were thinking of all of the different steps that you have to take even while the seed is underground or in other words, in utero in order for that seed to blossom. And then building a house, we chose this metaphor because we were thinking, well, uh, you need a strong foundation, you need some experts coming in to help you design and build the house. So we wanted to see which one of these three metaphors would work best. Um, you can go ahead and switch to the next slide. So in this case, these were the peer discourse sessions. That's what it, um, Framework calls them. We essentially did two focus groups. Um, there were just under 30 participants. Again, just like we did the in-depth interviews, we had a range of teens to older women, older adults, um, men and women, mom and dads, teenagers. Um, the focus groups ran for about an hour. They were conducted in both English and Spanish. We provided compensation thanks to our grant, and uh, we had them fill out a demographic form. So if you switch to the next slide. Um, and I'm happy to provide an interview guide if you're interested in adapting these steps for your own population. But we wanted to ask, based on each metaphor, you know, how does planting a seed symbolize healthy pregnancies or healthy babies? Do you think it's, there's any symbolism? What do you think the symbolism is and why do you think so? We did that with each of these different metaphors. We also held a picture up of, of each of these um, ideas like building a house, planting a seed, or playing the balloon game to actually show a vis visual and have them build a conversation with me as the facilitator, but also with each other about what possible symbolism exists in each of these different metaphors. You can go ahead and switch the slide. So um, interestingly enough, and exactly what frameworks said would happen, which was wonderful to see, the metaphors elicited truly different ways of thinking about infant mortality. If we brought up building a house, they often chose to focus their conversations on things like the symbolism between building the house and parenting. They, the conversation also focused around the environment. They would say things like, see, if the house isn't clean or you don't have a barrier uh, um, near the stairs, children could fall down the stairs of the house, and that's a lot like preventing infant mortality. So this metaphor kept the participants thinking about the role of um, the, the environment, the role of these external threats, parental responsibility, um, and it didn't necessarily move the conversation to thinking about these prenatal influences. When we talk, I'm going to move to the balloon game. When we talked about the balloon game and we brought that up, their conversation focused largely on early childhood and on the importance of the, of the community. They would say things like, um, we've got to make sure a child's development is healthy and happy, that they're supported, that they're loved, um, that the community has a role to play in helping the children be safe, happy, and loved which was important and we agree, but it didn't, that metaphor did not lend itself to initiating conversations about prenatal care. When we talked about planting a seed, however, it did. And it was really neat to see the conversation changed. They started talking about um, the importance of prenatal care, of caring for the seed even when you can't see it. 
They even mentioned things like you need to plant the seed during the summer months. You can't plant the seed in the winter or else it doesn't have as good of a chance. They likened that to not having um, sex when you weren't ready to really raise that child and harvest that child. So that was a neat correlation that they made. They also made a lot of connections between the steps and the behavior and the careful nurturing of a seed, both um, prenatally and postnatally, and the development of a child. So that was neat to see. Um, you can go ahead and switch the slide. They also talked a lot about the importance of love, readiness, and responsibility. Over and over again, those values came up. And Frameworks talks about paying really close attention to the values that people talk about because you want to incorporate those values in the metaphor that you choose. Okay, go ahead and switch the slide. So as you might imagine, we selected this seed metaphor to work with and to then um, do the last step of the Frameworks process, which it, it called um, it's called the persistence trials, where you're making sure that the metaphor can stay intact as it travels throughout a population. So you can switch the slide now. So in this prescriptive phase, or um, as we did a type of um, in-depth interviews in order to see how the participants um, talked to others about, their meta about the metaphor, we invited, again, a broad range of ages, teens to older adults. It was about 10 to 15 minutes in each <laughs> interview. We asked them to again identify the different symbolism that was in this seed metaphor, and we asked them to t imagine explaining this metaphor to someone else. What would they say if they explained it to someone else to see if they could um, appropriately capture the important elements of the metaphor and identify appropriate symbolism as they explained it to someone else. Okay, we can go to the next phase. So in order to do these interviews for these persistence trials, we basically said in what way will people interpret the, the different facets of, of the metaphor? And again, we asked them to make lists of interpretations and we asked them to pretend to say it to someone else to see if they could capture the important characteristics. Oh. Okay, you can go ahead and change the slide. So um, these are some of the things that they came up with for the symbolism. This is symbolism that they identified both in the focus groups and also in these persistence. Right? <laughs> this was this is like the shining slide of this presentation because it helps. It's exciting for us to see the ways that they could very easily identify steps of the process. Um, for planting a seed and easily relate that in a way that worked for them to prenatal and postpartum development. They talked about preparing to have a baby and how you have to till the soil, how you need to be healthy before pregnancy, and you've got to make sure the soil is really ready for fertilization and implantation. And they talked about conception. I already mentioned how they said you can't plant a seed in the winter time, you can only plant a seed in the summertime, meaning if you're not ready to plant a seed, you've got to use contraception so that you're, when you plant a seed, you're ready to have a baby. They talked about the fragility of a new little plant and how you have to be really careful caring for that baby in terms of getting car seats, um, taking care of it, making sure it's safe when it goes down for a nap. They also talked about prenatal care, how that's a lot like weeding the plant um, and weeding a garden, and those doctors can help us make sure that there's no weeds in our quote-unquote garden during prenatal care. Breastfeeding was a lot like watering it. Um, an interesting one that I hadn't thought about but that they mentioned was that if a plant, after it pops out of the ground, if it doesn't get sunshine, if it doesn't get water, it could wither and die. And that's the importance of a mom taking care of herself and making sure that she um, has enough self-care to be able to attend to the needs of the child. So um, we can go to the next slide. And so again, our recommendation, as Frameworks recommends, um, is to proactively establish a productive frame for the public because they believe that when we use a specific a meaningful metaphor, we can impact communication in a way that's really powerful because <laughs> metaphors are easy to understand. So 
So you can go ahead to the next slide. So um, I'll just stop here. I just got a few more slides after this, but I wanted to ask if there's any questions or um, your thoughts about this messaging or how you could apply the framework steps to problems that you're facing in your population. And then before you make any comments, I'll just say that I'll end this presentation with the next few slides talking about how we have tried to integrate this metaphor into clinics and to help providers and staff use this metaphor <laughs> in their interactions with patients. This is Erin. So we had a couple um, questions in the chat box. One was, do you think there are, there are good ways to shortcut the research process? For example, could we get good messaging ideas from having a couple of focus groups and applying frameworks past findings? Yes, I think so. If if time is an issue or funding and is, is an issue, I mean, I, I'm not a representative for frameworks, so I'm speaking from myself. But I think it's useful any way that you can try to gain uh, information <laughs> from the public about ways that they understand the issue and then use that information, like leverage that information in the way that you communicate about that issue and try to identify metaphors from whatever limited information you're able to get. I think I, I would support that. But as I'm saying that, I do remember in one of my trainings that they said to be really careful, however, in choosing your metaphor and testing it and disseminating it, because if that metaphor um, accidentally leads to incorrect conclusions or if they find symbolism that is not in line with the research or not accurate, you know, that could be damaging and dangerous. So you do want to make sure that that metaphor has been thoroughly tested with the population to make sure that it stays safe, it stays in line with what you want the public to be thinking. Uh, let me, the next question was, what are some good ways to come up with candidate metaphors? Yeah, that's a good question, too. Um, we had many conversations in person and over the phone um, just talking about the results of those in-depth interviews and the main themes that came out of that, and then literally mapping the gap, saying, you know, this seems to be an incorrect conclusion on the part of the public. This is what we know from the research. And so what is a, a way of thinking about this, a metaphor that can correctly um, illustrate this topic. So there were a lot of bad metaphors that we discarded um, before we arrived at those three that we wanted to test, but it was just a lot of brainstorming. And to be really honest, it was like looking at the world in new eyes, like as I would walk home from work or as I would do cooking or I was out in my garden, you know, I was thinking about what is what are these metaphors that exist all around us in our world that I could use to better communicate about prenatal health. And, and as I tried to look for good examples in my environment and talking through those examples with my colleagues, we came up with three to test. And as you saw, two of them didn't work. Um, and that the seed metaphor was the one that really became salient but it did require testing. So I probably wouldn't shortcut this step if you are unlimited on, in time. I think it is really important to spend time at least testing the metaphors that you come up with. Those were the only questions in the chat box, but if you have questions, you can press star seven to unmute your line. Okay, and you can go ahead to the next Wait. slide. Oh, go ahead. Oh, I thought I heard something, so um, feel free to jump in if you have any questions. So right now we are working with different clinics um, up in Northeast Indiana, and we've, we've been training um, medical assistants. So while we ultimately want to get this message into the hands of providers, we knew that the medical assistants had an opportunity sort of as a first line in the clinic that, that the patients often um, go through the medical assistants first, that the medical assistants could provide this flyer to the patients, but not only providing a flyer, I don't believe personally that this methodology is productive if we just disseminate flyers. Like we have to really interact with the patients and train those who are already interacting with patients to change the way that 
we're talking with them to include characteristics of the metaphor. So while we did create this flyer and pull in the symbolism of prenatal care and plants, we also gave this flyer to the medical assistants and we said, use this flyer when you go in to talk to your patients you know, if you know that that person is breastfeeding, you could say, oh, you're, you're breastfeeding today. That's great because that's a lot like watering a plant. And it's important to water that plant. And, or if we could tell that that um, person was ready to get pregnant, we could, they could mention the idea of, oh, that's like a lot like planting a seed and planting it when the conditions are right. Or it's important to till the soil. Are, are you doing some exercise to get ready to till the soil? Um, I'm just pulling off these conversation starters off the top of my head. But this flyer was not only to give to the public, but also to serve as a reminder for the medical assistants as ways to integrate the metaphor into conversations they were having. Um, you can turn to the next slide. Um, so we also created a video, and I, we might be able to show it at the end, and I'm also certainly very happy to send you the video. We created a video in English and in Spanish to illustrate this metaphor. We are working to play the video um, in waiting rooms. In the clinics we're working with, um, they have la um, a type of tablet in the room, so the videos are playing on the tablet while the patient is waiting for the provider to come into the exam room. And we're encouraging the clinics to have a plant. Some of the clinics couldn't have a live plant, so they're putting in um, fake plants. But even having a fake plant in the room serves as a way, as a type of object lesson, as a way for them to point to the plant when they're talking about tilling the soil or watering the plant. Um, or making sure that the water, that the plant is fertilized and how that's a lot like taking prenatal care vitamins. Um, we are encouraging pe people, both the public and the providers that we're training, to share the video on their websites, to share it on social media, to it, put it on flyers, and to ultimately perhaps use it in um, larger communication strategies like billboards, share on websites. We want to record a short version for radio ads. You can go ahead and switch to the next slide. Um, so our specific recommendations as we're working with these providers are to definitely define infant mortality as the number of children who die before the age of one, because the term is not commonly understood based on our small sample, but from what we understood, it was not commonly understood, and failure to provide a definition sort of led them to believe that the that the causes were um, child abuse, or they didn't know what infant mortality meant. So if you turn to the next slide, that's our next recommendation, that infant mortality does not mean that a child has been abused, and to be explicit about what does cause child mortality in that population. So in our case, it was talking about um, teen pregnancies, preterm births, and low birth weight. You can go ahead and slide switch. Um, this is just explaining what does in fact cause prenatal or infant mortality in that population and explaining what each of these terms mean. <coughs> then the next slide um, is tying in those values of love, responsibility, and readiness. I mentioned that frameworks spend a lot of time in the training talking about appealing to the values that already exist in the population. So when we're talking about taking care of a plant, you can talk about the responsibility of a woman or of a gardener to care, take these specific steps to care for a plant because responsibility is a value that we identified that was very important to the population. Love and readiness are also other values that we can incorporate in conversations as we use the metaphor. And you can switch to the next slide. Um, we understand, you know, that even doing, quote, everything right, um, pregnancy loss can still happen, and we don't want to stigmatize that. But you can also talk about that in terms of the plant metaphor, that even when a gardener does everything right, um, plants still die or some don't make it, and that might be because of, be because of weather conditions, because of problems um, within the plant itself just as bad weather and natural disasters can harm a seed or a plant. So we can still use the metaphor in trying to reduce the stigma of pregnancy loss. And then finally, I think there's just one or two 
it's important to, in our case, as we work with the Hispanic population to include messaging in Spanish and English, we have the flyer both in Spanish and English, and we also have the video in Spanish and English. And then um, you can turn to the last slide. And I understand as I um, share this that this is just one small intervention in a whole cog, uh, one small intervention in a whole wheel of interventions. And, um, providing increased knowledge and an increased understanding for our public is not always going to change behavior. There's going to be structural barriers that um, limit the use of prenatal care. And I understand that. And, and of course, we're just recommending um, really a, a pretty small change, but one that we think can enhance understanding. And with an enhanced understanding, we might see behavior change. And so I'll end on this slide um, that in the work that we're doing to evaluate this, we are um, not only doing qualitative interviews with the medical assistants and the providers who have been trained to use this metaphor, but we're also contacting the um, men and women who have received this metaphor in their encounters in the clinics and asking them um, two, four, and six weeks after their visit did they think about the metaphor during that time? Did it perhaps change any of their behavior or thought processes, processes as they thought about the metaphor in relation to pregnancy and postpartum care? And so if you are interested in receiving any of these, this information, like the video or the focus group guides, the flyer, the interview guides, I'm certainly happy to send those out. And if you happen to live in Indiana and um, want to join the study of evaluating this and doing trainings with your medical assistants or, or your providers, I will travel to see you and I'm happy to come and talk about how to um, implement this in your practice. So that's all I have. I'd love to hear the questions or concerns or other comments you might have. We have one question asking when this will be published. Yes, so we're in our second year of funding and we're still collecting data from the men and women who have received this intervention. So it probably won't be until um, 2019 since we've got to collect this data from the patients and the providers, analyze it, and then publish it. But I plan to do that and I can cer certainly contact CityMatch who can disseminate um, perhaps the publication upon, its, it, um, upon it being published. Um, and then just on what we Sorry, there's um, somebody speaking. Are you are you asking a question? Yeah, and he has a, I don't know, this, I don't know, if this is real coming up right here. But we don't even have any of the coupons. We don't have any, anything. Sorry, I believe somebody is speaking on the line, and, and maybe they're just off of mute. All right. Sorry. Sorry. Do we have any other questions for Dr. Place? Yeah, please don't hesitate to reach out. We have had a fun time um, rolling this out and applying frameworks methodology to a very specific problem with a specific population in our state. Um, the video that perhaps we can show you in these remaining few minutes is um, really geared toward the population in Indiana because we talk about um, Indiana Hoosiers, um, but certainly the, Indi the film could be adapted and produced for its populations in your state and for whatever problem um, you might be facing. All right, I can, I can attempt to screen share and see if we can watch the video that way. Um, I, I'm not making any promises, but we can sure try. <laughs> okay. Okay, are you all seeing a PowerPoint right now? Yes. Yeah. I'm going to quick pause it. Can you hear it? No. 
No, okay. That's what I was worried about. Can you see the video playing? I can hear it, but it's just really low, but I can hear it. Yeah, okay, just maybe if I try turning it up. But in India, the mortality rate of Latino infants is much too high. More Latino babies die before the age of one in Indiana than the national average. To have thriving, healthy generations of Latino children, we need to increase birth weight prevent preterm birth, and avoid teen pregnancy. A helpful way to think about how to have healthy babies is to think about how to grow healthy plants. Care for the soil by maintaining a healthy weight prior to becoming pregnant. Avoid smoking anything. Minimize alcohol consumption and avoid all illicit recreational drugs. Don't plant prior to planting season. Use protection when having sex except when you want to get pregnant and raise a child to adulthood. Plant in a sunny area, avoid stress, and cultivate happy relationships. Make sure your seed is fertilized by taking prenatal vitamins. Iron and folic acid are particularly important. Water the seed by leading a healthy lifestyle, eating nutritiously, and staying active. Tend the garden by meeting with the doctor early in the first trimester and regularly attending prenatal care visits. Let the seed grow naturally and go the full 39 to 40 week term before giving birth. Bad weather or natural disasters can harm seeds, even with proper care. Understand that complications like miscarriage or stillbirth happen. A child, like a healthy plant, must be kept safe. Use car seats. Lay the child on his or her back when sleeping and ensure the child receives ongoing medical care and nutrition. Our Latino community, like a thriving garden, is sustained by a supportive community network. Share this information on social media and tell those you love how to nourish a new generation of healthy Latino children in our community. So it looks like it got stuck a little bit. It flows more easily, um, perhaps if the bandwidth is, is larger. And then the other, only other thing I wanted to say is that we do have a Spanish version of it as well. Yeah, thank you all for bearing with our technical glitches. <laughs> all right, we have a, a few folks in the comment box that are providing their email address wanting more information so I can get you all connected. Are there any other questions? Yeah, we're, I'm, I'm so glad that you were able to um, be on the line and help us as we navigate this new process for us here in Indiana, but please don't hesitate to reach out if you have any questions or comments or concerns. It looks like we have one question um, and comment. Um, the comment is, this, this information is ter terrific. It is valuable framing in clinics and for women to understand what they can do for a healthy birth slash baby. Do you have messaging for policymakers, community, et cetera, to understand that broad factors, especially social determinants of health and stru structural social determinants of health? Yeah, that's so important. That's really the limitation of this project is that it doesn't address those larger structural determinants of public health. And if you were on the, the line with, um, with, I, I forget the other speaker's name, he spoke last week about how to reframe public health and health equity. I think he gave some really great ideas for how to reframe um, structural inequalities that ultimately affect populations like this and affect all of us. And so some of his recommendations um, could be useful as we pair um, his recommendations with a, a more behavioral oriented intervention like this. Thanks, Jean. This is Carol Gilbert. I think you did a great presentation and great research, and I hope you're going to bring it to our conference. Oh, thank you. It's good to hear from you, Carol. Um, when is your conference? If, it, is it in September? Yeah, it is. Okay. I, is it in Kentucky? No, Portland, oh. Oregon. Oh, it's in Portland. Okay, great. Well, I will look into that. I would, I would love to come and share it. 
the abstracts are open. Okay, great. I will look at that. And as we mentioned, um, this call is being recorded, and then um, I'll be sending out the resources that were discussed during the call to everybody. All right, I don't see any more questions or comments. Well, thank you for allowing me the opportunity to present. Yes, thank you very much for, for willing to present on such short notice. We greatly appreciate it. So, Thank you all for attending today. All right, I think that's good. So, Okay, thanks, thank you so much, Erin. Mm -hmm. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.